Anyway, now each of our debaters will receive three questions. The debater will have two minutes to respond to the question, then his opponent will have one minute to respond to the response, or however you want to put it. Okay. Okay, the first question is for Mr. David Wood. Because the Quran affirms belief in the Holy Bible, how can uh, the dear Ahmed hold a contrary position to you and the Quran? Uh, yes, that whoever brought that up, that is an important point. Um, Muslims usually don't know that they're supposed to have as much respect for my scriptures as I have for my scriptures. Uh, the Quran affirms over and over and over again that the Torah and the Gospel are inspired. And by the way, we know from Muslim commentators that this referred to uh, the Old Testament in general and even the Talmud was treated as inspired scripture by the Muslims. Muslims didn't know what was in there, or otherwise they wouldn't have affirmed it. But uh, according to Surah 7, 157, according to Surah 3, 3 through 4, uh, chapter 5, verses 43 through 48, over and over and over again, we read that the scriptures of the Jews and Christians are inspired. And we read in Surah 6, verse 114 to 115, and Surah 1827, that no one can corrupt Allah's word. Okay, so Muslim wants to say, yes, it was inspired, but it was corrupted later. No, the Quran says no one can corrupt Allah's word. And what's most amazing is that in uh, Surah 1094, Muhammad was having doubts about his prophethood, and he was commanded, if you have doubts, go ask the people who read the book before you. Muhammad is commanded to go to us to see if his revelation is from God. If he'd done it, because he would have found out it's not the Word of God, but all of that is beside the point. The only point here would be the scriptures that Nadir has been attacking in this debate, misrepresenting, distorting, are scriptures affirmed in his holy book. And so all of his attacks, based on the Bible, can be regarded as attacks against his own Quran, prophets, and God. You got that uh, commentary, which says chapter 4, verse 75, is only for Muslims? This is only referring to Muslims. Once again, you know, we've already been through this. We've, I've given you the statements of the companions and how they understood it. It's clear, and he is right, Muslims have been, we should respect the, the, the scripture, the previous scripture, and that's why I'm very, and I know some Muslims, they try to slam it and stuff like that. I'm not like one of them. And uh, I hope at least I, I've demonstrated that. But, the Quran clearly says that the Bible has been corrupted. It's like chapter 4, verse uh, 157. It says, referring to the New Testament, or referring to the book which teaches that Jesus was crucified, that the Christians follow, they follow nothing but conjecture. Conjecture is the same thing as corruption. He has misrepresented chapter 10, verse 94. Chapter 10, verse 94 says, and, and, see, and to ask those who came before you, this is talking about the story of Moses parting the sea. You have read that out of context. Okay? So he has taken the scripture out of Thank context. You. Our next question is for Mr. Uh, Nadir Ahmed. Uh, I will never embrace Islam. Do you hate me? Do you want to kill me? And what really does Islam teach? No, absolutely. Well, I don't hate you. Okay, that is that is uh, very clear. Um, we have already, uh, you know, shown, you know, from the actually from from the last video. Actually, this is kind of off topic because we're kind of talking about Islam, but no problem. The Prophet Muhammad, some of them gave clear instructions. Now, notice, I'm quoting Muhammad over here. Okay, no commentary. When he says, "When you go to the Jews and the Christians, his advice to them is make things easy for them." All right. Do not create aversion in their hearts. And love one another and do not differ. This is from the Hadith of Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Okay? So that was his advice in what we are supposed to do with a Christian. In fact, 
Let me, let, me, let me read it exactly word for word, just so that there's no confusion over here. Okay? Oops. The timer, should you please stop the time for a second? We have a uh, malfunction with the uh, microphone here. Actually, it's a Okay. Okay, please continue with the time. Okay, since we're changing topics to the topic of Islam, sorry about that, I didn't pull up my notes. It says over here, and I um, keep losing my reference here. Actually, you know what? Let me do, let me read it next time I come up here, okay? But yeah, we could, uh, I'll, I'll go ahead and answer that next time, but I would be more interested in reading the, uh, the, the reference, which, uh, which uh, I believe David would have, that, you know, chapter 4, verse 75, like someone wrote a commentary, so it's really not evidence, but someone wrote a commentary, because I'm ignorant of that. I'm not aware of someone that this can only refer to Muslims. Go ahead. Well, the verse doesn't say that it only refers to Muslims. The commentators give the historical setting, and in its historical setting, it applies to Muslims. So, um, Tafsir of Ibn Abbas, uh, one of Muhammad's companions, Allah then mentioned their dislike of fighting in the way of Allah, saying, how should ye a group of believers not fight for the cause of Allah and obedience of Allah against the people of Mecca? And it goes on to say that this was about people who weren't allowed to flee Mecca with Muhammad. You find the exact same thing in Tafsir Jalalain, you find the exact same thing in Tafsir of Ibn Kathir. So your three greatest commentaries all say this was revealed about the people of uh, Muslims in Mecca. Now, uh, I agree with Nadir that this particular debate isn't about Islam, but it was an interesting question. Uh, does Nadir hate and want to fight us? Notice what Nadir said about Surah 929 of the Quran. It commands uh, people to fight the persecutors and things like that. Uh, this is a quotation from Nadir yesterday. But the greatest persecutors are actually the American Christians. So if that's revealed about fighting persecutors, and we're the greatest persecutors, why wouldn't you want to kill us? Okay, our next question is for uh, David. Why is the God of the, of the Muslim always angry? And the follow-up question to that is, uh, a Muslim man who dies for Allah will go to paradise and get 70 virgins. 70 virgins is enough for, for eternity? Why satisfy the flesh in paradise? What does a female Muslim get when she dies? Uh, what was the first part of that? I was trying to jot down all the different questions. Uh, why is the God of Muslim always angry? Well, uh, Allah is not always angry. Um, Allah can love good Muslims. Of course, Surah 3, verse 32 of the Quran says that Allah has no love for unbelievers. And most people are unbelievers, and so that's a lot of people to be really angry at. And so I'd be angry too. Uh, if, uh, if, if I really had no love for unbelievers and I look around and I see most people are, are unbelievers, uh, people are rejecting Islam, people are criticizing Islam, uh, I'd be angry too. Um, men get 70 virgins, uh, how is that going to be enough for eternity? It's actually important to note, uh, you see the number 70 and 72, that's actually the minimum according to the Muslim sources. That's what you get when you make it. Uh, if you're a really, really good Muslim, you can get way, way more than that. Um, it'll be enough for eternity because these are specially designed sex machines. They're ready to go. And, uh, and uh, Muhammad promises, Allah promises, Allah promises in the hadith that Muslims will have eternal erections. They will have divinely empowered erections to have sex for all eternity. So, I mean, it's straightforward if you believe these sources. No problem here. Uh, what is in store for female Muslims? Well, according to Sahih al-Bukhari, Islam's most trusted source uh, of uh, teachings from Muhammad, when a woman dies, she gets to stand in the corner waiting for her husband to come and enjoy her. That's what you do. The problem is, your husband, who now has you, also has these at least 70 specially designed sex machines. And so I think... Oh, sorry, sorry. Oh, and so I think uh, Muslim women are going to be standing in their corners for a long, long time. But that's what you have to look forward to. Sorry about that. Yeah. 
you know, I don't think there's any need, as I said, to get angry, and there's no need to resort to mocking and making fun. Maybe you want to do that, that's, you can go ahead and do that, but I'm not going to do that. Okay, um, well, let me go ahead and read the, uh, actually, the, the uh, commentary which you quoted does not say that it's only referring to Muslims, chapter 4, verse 75, okay? It does not say that. This is a fabrication. Chapter 4, verse 75 is referring for all people. The text of the Quran is very clear. We know from the statements of Omar, and we know from the statements of, of Abdul Aziz, is to wage war on any enemies of the disbelievers will fight to secure their safety. I hope you'll come up here and they'll apologize for fabricating that here tonight. Um, as far as, you know, eternal erections, this is not a teaching of canonical scripture. He's just trying to mock and ridicule because he's upset. And I'm not sure why he's upset because the moderator said, if you're going to get upset tonight, you got 60 seconds to leave. Okay, so there's no need to get upset here. I mean, if you don't want me to talk about this, I won't talk about it. I'll go home. Okay. Here, okay, next question is for Nadir. Uh, your own prophet praised a copy of the Torah and placed it on a pillow. So none elude Duad 4434. Why did he praise it when it has such violent teachings? Quote unquote violent teachings. Yeah, this is actually an error you'll find on the Answering Islam website. Okay, I got to show you something here. Um, you see, like the books which uh, David, can I just borrow this one book here real quick? Um, okay, I got to show you something. See this book here? These books did not exist inside the, 14, inside the year 600. There was no such thing as books oh, at that time. They were written on parchments. In fact, if you were to get the Torah in one room, it'd probably fill up this room. So when you read the Hadith about he put it on a pillow and he praised that book, he cannot be talking about the whole Torah because books did not exist at that time. Okay? It was a parchment of the Torah that was placed on that pillow. Okay, but yeah, the Quran is very clear. It's like chapter 4, verse 157, that, you know, um, that, if, that, that, that the New Testament and the Bible has been corrupted. By the way, I found that hadith. I'm sorry about that. I, let me switch back to the Islam debate over there. I like that debate. This is what Prophet Muhammad sallam, says about treatment to the Jews and the Christians. He says, treat the people with ease. Don't be hard upon them. Give them glad tidings. And don't fill them with hatred. And love one another. And do not differ. That's the Prophet Muhammad, sallallahu alaihi wasallam. Taught. As for you know some commentary where it said that chapter four, verse seventy-five was only referring to Muslims. This is not true. Okay, this is a fabrication. And again, it goes back to the most important point of tonight's debate. It's missing what I call the golden rule. Okay which is to fight against oppression. Listen, either God wants you to fight against Adolf Hitler or he doesn't. Islam teaches us to fight against evil people like that. Okay, and, you know, the whole thing about, you know, sex in heaven, uh, you know, we could debate that, you know. But, if, but what, I do, what I'm not interested in is mocking and getting angry and stuff like that. I'm just going to go Thank home you. with that case. Here said, Muhammad said, be good to the Jews and Christians. Um, that's nonsense. Muhammad told his followers to fight the Jews and Christians. But if you were a dhimmi, you were under the uh, extreme conditions, Umar does tell us that Muslims are supposed to live, uh, uh, treat them well. Watch, why? Umar said, I advise you to fulfill Allah's financial uh, obligation made with the dhimmi as it is the Dima of your prophet and the source of your livelihood of your dependents. They're a source of your livelihood, so don't be too harsh with them. As for Nadir's claim that books didn't exist in the 7th century, that's total nonsense. Um, you have books, uh, you have books uh, well before that. Um, what Nadir is saying, I think, is that the Jews uh, had scrolls, but um, if you've ever been to a synagogue, they have the scrolls. You can fit the entire Torah into it's a pretty big scroll. You could certainly put it on a pillow. And that's exactly what happens in Sinan Abu Dawood, number 44-34, where Muhammad swears that that Torah that Nadir's been ridiculing is the Word of God. Thank you. Now, I do not ridicule the Torah. I do not ridicule the New Testament. Wait, wasn't 
Okay, David, this question for you. How can you say that Christianity is a religion of peace since your God is so violent and unforgiving to the point that he would crush his own son in order to forgive sins? How can I say that God isn't violent when Jesus uh, was sent to the cross to die for our sins? Well. According to the Bible, God is perfectly just, and that means that all sin has to be punished. God, unlike the God of the Quran, cannot sweep sin under the rug and pretend it doesn't happen. That would be very nice, but it wouldn't be perfectly just. But God is also perfectly loving, and so he's willing to do anything, whatever it takes, to save the people he loves. And so what you find in the Bible is that Sin creates a problem, because God must punish it, and what would be the punishment for sin? Well, according to the Bible, it uh, requires blood sacrifice. But if God is perfectly loving, what's he going to do? Well, whatever it takes. And so in Christianity, we have a reconciliation uh, of these two doctrines about God. And so it, according to Christianity, because of the sacrifice that Jesus made, at the end of time, all sin has been punished. Either you take it upon, either you take it yourself, or Jesus took it for you when uh, he became the blood sacrifice. All sin has been punished, and yet God did what only the God of Christianity would be willing to do, because that's the God who loves unbelievers, who sent Jesus into the world while we were yet sinners, die for the ungodly. Well, you know, I think you have a clear teaching inside 2 Chronicles, chapter 15, and this is what we were kind of talking about, which teaches to kill unbelievers who will not accept Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. We went back and forth on that. But by the way, I would like kind of an apology from David. I don't think there's any teaching that chapter 4, verse 75, is only referring to Muslims. It's just not there. Uh, let me repeat that hadith again for you. It's my favorite hadith, and this is why I took your friends out to go to the beach. You know, let's see, this is how I implement this in my life. Uh, yeah, tell me, uh, I'm doing the wrong thing here. The prophet said, treat the people with ease. Don't be hard upon them. Give them glad tidings. And don't fill them with aversion. And love one another. And do not differ. And that's, that's how you that fall. Now you got to convince me now tonight, no, no, I'm misunderstanding this now. And by the way, I'd like an apology about that comment you made about that, about there's some commentary or something like that. I don't think that exists. But as for, you know, the doctrines of Christianity, you know, I guess that's probably a different debate. Okay, our final question for the question and answer period is for Nadir. If you used the blue letter Bible for your translation of peace, why did you stop on the third definition? Read the fourth, it's Christian peace in the context. Um, I think he's referring to Matthew chapter 13, verse uh, ch chapter 10, verse 13, where Jesus says, "And let your peace come back to you." You see, the issue here tonight. Let's just go along with that interpretation. It doesn't matter. We understand the, the, the important point here is when they reject Jesus, you let your peace return back to you. And my understanding of that, you're no longer peaceful. And why is that wrong? You know, and the explanation, I mean, they have a lot of explanations, but that doesn't make any sense. My explanation makes sense. But the important point which I want to point out tonight is, you know, and the most important I mentioned is from the beginning. The Bible bashing stuff, I'm not interested in. And I think I always mentioned that in my debates. I'm not interested in that. <coughs> the point here is the golden rule. You know, fight. Those people are oppressed. When I look at the world today, I pick up the newspaper, I read world history, that's what the world needs. The passages which David quoted us, I believe that's cowardice. You're at peace with all men. The Bible doesn't call you to fight against Hitler and losers like Pol Pot and stuff like that. The Quran does. That's true guidance. What you have might appear to be guidance. It's misguidance. And that's the most important part which 
message I want to send out. Well, I think the point of the question was referring to Nadir saying earlier that he had looked up the definition of uh, Irene. And the point was, if you look up the word in a Greek dictionary, you'll get various meanings it could have in a Greek context. But one of the definitions is the specifically Christian uh, definition of peace, which was carried over from the Jewish uh, Shalom. So when Paul goes around greeting people, again, he says, Irene. That is the translation is that Paul is a Jew, so he's giving the Jewish greeting. Uh, so what you have in Matthew 10, again, is you give the greeting, and if people reject the gospel, you take back your greeting, and you do what? You fight them. You go get a sword, you go get a gun, you wage jihad, you gather your army. No, you leave and give them a sign that God is ultimately going to judge them. That's what the text says. Again, to say otherwise is sheer deception. Well, our topic is, does Christianity promote violence towards non-Christians? Does Christianity promote violence towards non-Christians? Have we seen any indication that Christians are commanded to go out and slaughter unbelievers. No, we've seen exactly the opposite. So the context of this entire debate and the references I pulled out uh, were addressed to whether Christians are supposed to go out and fight non-Christians. Nadir responds, well, but does God want us to fight Hitler? Well, we know in the New Testament that God does ordain governments for that sort of purpose. That has nothing to do with our topic. That is not going out and fighting unbelievers. I'm going out to kill him because he rejects Jesus as his Lord and Savior. That had nothing to do with why anyone was fighting Hitler or Pol Pot or any evil, ruthless dictator. It had nothing to do with fighting uh, non-Christians because they're non-Christians. Nadir appeals over and over again to 2 Timothy 3.16. Obvious what it means in context. You can learn from all kinds of things. You can learn from everything in the Old Testament. But think about Nadir's interpretation. Judas hanged himself. According to Nadir, that means I should go and hang myself. <laughs> Satan tried to get Jesus to jump off the temple. According to Nadir, I guess that means I should either jump off the temple or try to get other people to jump off the temple or try to get uh, the Lord Jesus to jump off the temple. Does that make sense, that we are commanded to do these things? No. Does the correct interpretation, namely that we can learn from all of these things, that we can profit from all of these things, that these things are profitable for doctrine? Yes, you learn from what Judas did. You learn from things Satan does. You can learn from all of this. You can learn from the entire Old Testament. And that's why we see Paul and Peter and Jude telling us that we can learn from these passages. Very clear meaning. But whatever it, but Paul certainly doesn't mean that we are to carry out every command in the Old Testament. Never said that. Um, he keeps asking for the commentary. He says, it doesn't say it, ref it only refers to unbelievers. Right. It says that this passage was revealed as a command to fight the people of Mecca because they weren't letting certain Muslims uh, leave and flee with Muhammad. That's the historical context. Now why would we say that this passage obviously doesn't mean that Muslims are supposed to go all over the world rescuing the oppressed? Because of what the Quran says later, that you fight the unbelievers. Muslims become the oppressors, oppressing everyone, making dimmies out of Jews and Christians, and giving pagans and atheists, two options, convert or die. That doesn't sound like you're going to rescue them uh, from their oppression. So uh, I pointed out in my opening statement, Muslims only have a couple of options if they want to try and uh, make Islam sound more peaceful and make Christianity sound more violent so that Islam doesn't look as bad by comparison. You can distort the clear teachings of the New Testament. We saw Nadir do that over and over again uh, with the Gospels, uh, trying to show that, aha, you're taking back your greeting of peace and leaving things up to God. That really means you're going to come and fight them. Absolute nonsense. Taking the verse off the end of a parable that Jesus is 
uh, that Jesus is uh, telling and trying to convince us that he's calling us to fight and kill his enemies, something his followers certainly didn't see, and something that makes absolutely no sense within the context. And then I also pointed out that Muslims can try to apply the Old Covenant uh, teachings to us. We can certainly learn uh, from the Old Covenant, but it's not the covenant we are under. The covenant Christians are under commands us to love everyone, to harm no one, to do good to everyone, to live in peace with everyone, to do unto others as we would have them do unto you, and to look at all of this and say, somehow, somehow this means that you are supposed to go out and fight unbelievers simply because they're unbelievers makes absolutely no sense. And again, the only people who would ever want to do this uh, are people who have no other way of defending their religion. Yeah, I think um, the rule of yeah, I think the rule of tonight's debate, and I believe I honor that debate, talking to George Zeig, is that we stay on topic. In my debate with this on Islam last uh, yesterday, how many verses of the Bible did I did I bring up? How many attacks upon Christianity did I do? Zero. Okay, so I think we need to stay on topic. So I found myself kind of defending both Islam and Christianity, and and, and also my position on Christianity. And so a little bit difficult to do. So I just want to let you know that you know part of the rules of tonight's debate. Well, of course, first, you don't get mad. If you get mad, you've got to leave. And you've got 60 seconds to do that. Secondly, you know, you stick on topic. You don't bring up the Bible when it's time to debate Islam, stuff like that. So I think I did stay on topic. Um, I stayed from the very beginning. You know, the most important thing to me is the issue of the golden rule. You know, and um, he had just slammed Islam left and right. And, you know, I think that was very unfair for me. But, you know, I think it was, anyone who saw the debate yesterday, can see just exactly how he misrepresents Islam. You know, uh, we are ordered to fight the disbelievers, yes, of course. But when you look at the historical context of the Quran, who were the disbelievers? And this was proven in tonight's, in last night's debate. And so he's just recycling refuted arguments. The disbelievers were, were one of the most violent, sadistic, and intolerant people ever to be recorded in world history during the life of Muhammad. Surah 9 verse 29 came to meet this challenge and fought so that people can have the right to believe in the religion of their choice. And that was proven inside that debate. As for the topic of tonight's debate, I think it was very clear. The explanations which David Wood brought up just didn't make sense. It doesn't add up. But because I want to make this debate as clear as possible, I try not to get in big exegetical discussions. All I'm showing you tonight is the explanation I gave made sense. The most important point tonight, and he's actually right, I did make a mistake about the found found. I apologize, I, mis, I mispronounced that, I apologize. But the meaning I gave you is right. Jesus became happy when they made this pledge. It has nothing to do with covenants, it has nothing to do with laws. This is his nature, that when you kill people in his name, he becomes happy. That was a pledge. 2 Timothy 3.16 says all scripture. But now somehow he brought some weird explanation that all doesn't mean all, it means some scripture. No, all, but by doing that, that proves my point tonight. So much of the Bible, the Christians have to disqualify. Don't follow these teachings. You will be misguided if you benefit from those teachings. It has nothing to do with covenants. It has nothing to do with law. That was my main focus tonight. It's a book of misguidance. The peace which you are talking about is cowardice. That's not the type of peace we need in the world today. We need chapter 4, verse 75. And what is wrong with you that you fight not in the cause of Allah for those who are weak, oppressed, and ill-treated? This verse is all-inclusive for all of people. He said that Christians lied, actually, that Muslims mistreated uh, the Jews and the Christians. This is not true. Let me uh, recite the one hadith again from Muhammad. So, he, so I'm quoting probably the greatest source here. The Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi said, and this is when to go out to the Christians. It says, treat the people with ease. Don't be hard on them. Give them glad tidings. And don't fill them aversion. And love one another. And don't differ. And that's why I took your phone. Let's go out and let's have fun. Let's go to the beach. Stuff like that. Like implement this in my life. So 
that I believe the explanation I gave made sense. When Jesus said he wants, he said he believes that the issue in Luke is that the enemies is not defined. Sure it is. You could use First John to define the enemies. And Jesus said it's a consistent theology from the Old Testament to the New Testament that people who don't accept Jesus, look at the rage, look at the anger. He says, for those who do not wish to that I should reign upon them, bring them hither and slay them before me. Matthew chapter 10 verse 15 is clear. When he says, and take your peace back, whether shalom or whatever, it doesn't matter. The clear meaning there. You are not to be peaceful with those people who reject Jesus. As for his explanation, it doesn't make sense. It really doesn't. And of course, um, you know, I just want to leave you with this. That the teachings of the Quran, the whole Quran, whether abrogated or not, you can follow all of it. Surah 4 verse 75 is true guidance. That's what the world needs. We don't need the peace which is actually cowardice, which you, which you hear from, uh, from David.